The next item of business is a statement by Hamza Yousaf on improving Scotland's air quality, putting in place Scotland's low emission zones. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Hamza Yousaf. Uh, ten minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, clean air is essential for our health and well-being. Overall, Scotland's air quality is good, but we know that areas of poorer air quality still exist in some of our towns and cities. We also know that some groups in society, uh, the very young and old, those with existing respiratory conditions, those with cardiovascular conditions, they are, of course, more likely to be affected by poor air quality. Uh, people rightly expect to be able to breathe clean air. The Scottish Government is determined to ensure that we continue to make progress in tackling the issue, uh, this particular issue, and achieve our vision of Scotland having the best air quality in Europe. Low emission zones are a tool that we can use to help manage the impact of vehicle pollution within areas where air quality is poor. They allow us to put restrictions on the vehicles that can enter designated areas and help encourage a move towards cleaner vehicles and, of course, the greater use of public transport, an ambition all of us share around this chamber. In our programme for government, we committed to establishing low emission zones in each of the four biggest cities by 2020, with the first being put in place by 2018. In October, it was announced that Glasgow will be the location of the first low emission zone in Scotland and will be in place, as I say, by 2020. In addition, by 2023, low emission zones will be established in other air quality management areas where the national low emission framework demonstrated their value in improving air quality. This commitment to delivering multiple low emission zones across Scotland over the next six years is ambitious. It represents the largest ever programme of transport-based air quality mitigation in Scotland. The design and implementation of low emission zones will be led by local councils, but we recognise that the delivery of these ambitions will require partnership working across the whole of Scottish Government and indeed with a range of public bodies. We have therefore created a low emission zones leadership group with the four largest cities and SEPA to, suppose, to support the implementation of low emission zones. This will ensure that low emission zones are based on robust evidence and that stakeholders and the public are engaged and involved. This group will share knowledge, identify issues where nationally consistent standards for the design and delivery of low emission zones are required. We're working collaboratively with Glasgow City Council as part of the multidisciplinary delivery group they have established to progress the design of the low emission zone for Glasgow. Uh, work is underway with Edinburgh City Council, Dundee and Aberdeen City Councils to support them on developing their plans for progressing low emission zones. Decisions on the location and design of low emission zones, as I've said, will be led by local authorities. We're urging them to be ambitious in their design, ambitious in their scope, with all vehicles being included within the low emission zones at the appropriate time. The design process will build on the assessment of the evidence developed in partnership between local councils, SEPA and Transport Scotland over the last 12 months. We know that low emission zones will set an environmental limit on vehicles on designated roads within affected towns and cities, allowing access to only the cleanest vehicle. Only when local authorities create the final designs will we know exactly how many vehicles will be affected. It is intended that low emission zones in Scotland will be based on road access restriction schemes. These schemes exclude vehicles that do not meet the relevant emission standard with a penalty imposed on non-compliant vehicles when they enter the designated zone. The aim of low emission zones is to improve air quality. Um, we want to incentivise compliance and discourage non-compliant vehicles from entering the zone. It is, of course, for local authorities to decide the timescales for phasing in or different vehicle types, but we expect that low emission zones will have nationally consistent lead-in times. Now, these lead-in periods will allow those affected, bus and commercial fleet operators and private car owners, time to prepare before full compliance is required. To support consideration of design, a national consultation on the principles for low emission zones was launched on the 6th of September. The consultation closed uh, at the end of last month on the 28th of November with over 900 responses received. A remarkable 
uh, response uh, to that consultation. The consultation sought views on issues such as emissions criteria, uh, scope of the vehicle to be included, uh, enforcement and penalties, and also discussion about leading times and phasing. Analysis of the response, of course, with such a high response is underway and outputs from the process will inform decision making around the standards to be adopted in the design of low emission zones. The consultation responses will inform the finalising of the National Low Emissions Framework document. Uh, going forward, this will provide the framework within which low emission zones will be introduced and is a key commitment of the Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy published in 2015. Now to turn to one or two uh, of the sectors that may well be, I hope, positively affected uh, by low emission zones. The bus sector are, of course, integral to helping manage air quality issues in towns and cities, providing a key alternative to private car use. A well-used low emission bus fleet will help to reduce emissions. Uh, engagement with the bus industry on low emission zones is ongoing. Operators have, have expressed understandable concerns in relation to securing compliant fleets to allow service levels to be maintained when low emission zones come into force. To support this, the programme for government committed to working with commercial, uh, the, with the bus, commercial, uh, commercial and bus sectors, uh, the Energy Saving Trust and Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership to establish an engine retrofitting centre in Scotland. Discussions are well underway with the Energy Saving Trust and the bus sector to establish the bus emission abatement retrofit programme in Scotland. To support this, we have committed 1.6 million for the first phase of the programme by March 2018. The seventh round of the Green Bus Fund has also been successfully completed and will introduce another 47 low emission buses into service in due course. We believe that low emission zones should also interact with other transport policies. We will encourage local councils to consider wider measures to tackle congestion such as traffic management and parking arrangements as part of the consideration of implementing low emission zones. This approach could help improve bus journey times, make car use less attractive and increase modal shift towards active travel and public transport. Low emission zones have the potential, presiding officer, to act as a catalyst for the reimagined city centre placemaking, helping to ensure our city centres remain vibrant places to live, work, shop and socialise. We will encourage local councils to consider low emission zones as a component part of larger projects going on in their cities. Low emission zones must also be designed with consideration of the potential for unintended secondary effects, such as, for example, the potential for displacement of air pollution to other areas out with the low emission zone. Equality issues are central to consideration, particularly to the communities around our towns and cities who rely on public transport to move around. We anticipate that local councils will carry out equality impact assessments as part of the process of designing the low emission zone. Uh, low emission zones, of course, are not the only measure that will help us to address the issues around vehicle pollution and deliver our vision for the best air quality in Europe. We will continue to drive down vehicle exhaust emissions through our ambitious target for phasing out the need for new petrol and diesel vehicles by 2032. To support this, we will continue to expand the electric vehicle charging network through a range of incentives provided to local authorities, to businesses and indeed individuals. Funding, of course, will be crucial to this to support the design and implementation of low emission zones to meet the 2020 commitment and they will, of course, be considered as part of the forthcoming spending review. The programme for government also established an air quality fund to support local authorities with air quality management areas to deliver <coughs> transport mitigation, transport-based mitigation as identified by the low national low emissions framework. Despite making considerable progress, air pollution remains a significant public health and social justice issue, presiding officer, in some towns and cities. Through the introduction of low emission zones, we are adopting an approach which will help us deliver improvements in air quality and public health. They will, of course, benefit people here and now today but crucially, they will create a healthier world for future generations to come. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement, and I'll allow around 20 minutes for that. Uh, could members who wish to ask a question please press the request buttons? 
And I call Jamie Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I start by thanking the Minister for foresight of his statement. Though with the, the greatest of respect, there's nothing in this 10-minute statement that we didn't already know. Uh, the Minister confirmed today that the first scheme will be in place by 2018 and our four largest cities by 2020. Well, 2018 is just 24 days away. On these benches, we are supportive of the eventual outcome of the zones, but are concerned about the unrealistic timescales for rollout and a distinct lack of detail in the plans. There remain straightforward and substantial questions that need to be answered. What type of vehicles will be affected by the new access restrictions? When will these vehicles be restricted from entering our cities? Will we end up with confusing and differential schemes in different cities? What type of infrastructure will need to be in place when it goes live? And how long will that infrastructure take to build? How much will it cost? And who is going to pay for it? Deputy Presiding Officer, there are many thousands of law-abiding uh, everyday drivers, city centre residents and local businesses who will be affected by these restrictions and are watching these proceedings justifi justifiably worried about the potential of being barred from driving to and from their own doorsteps. Can the Minister answer some of these very basic questions today? Hamza Yousaf. Uh, yeah, yes, I can. And look, I have the greatest respect of, for, for, for the member, uh, and he knows that. Uh, what I would say, and, you know, it is only right and proper, of course, that we come to Parliament, not just with the detail, of which I respect, he, he may well know some of that, but also, of course, for him to ask questions just in the manner that he has and to get some clarification and for members across the chamber to ask and to scrutinise and where appropriate critique uh, government policy. So I, I think uh, the statement very much justified uh, in, in that regard. Uh, some of the questions he asks, uh, of course, many of them will be answered once we do the analysis of the consultation. I'm sure he may well have responded to that consultation. Uh, which asks what kind of vehicle type and so on and so forth. And when I was asked about low emission zones in the committee a couple of days ago, uh, I made the point, which I think, I hope he'll, he'll agree with me is a very reasonable one, where we will have, of course, a national framework for towns, cities, local authorities who wish to adopt a low emission zone. But clearly that will have to leave flexibility because we know one size doesn't fit all. We know that what might work for Glasgow's low emission zone might not work for Dundee's or, for example, other areas uh, of, of air quality uh, management. So we have to allow that flexibility. In terms of um, 2018 and, and, and how, uh, of course, we are, we are only uh, and less than a month away uh, from 2018, of course, we do say that we'd introduce the first uh, low emission zone in 2018. I don't expect it will be on the 1st of January. Of course, not Glasgow and uh, the national government uh, here are working very, very closely in order to make sure that is introduced in 2018. And to give him some reassurances, uh, I received uh, an email, and I think members across the chamber will have received it from the Federation of Small Businesses, a very welcomed email, an email highlighting where they thought there had to be uh, some consideration, particularly around this idea of phasing and leading times. And I thought that was very, very important. And let me give the member, and I'll finish on this point, just give the member as much reassurance as I can that the government, and I know the local authority in terms that we've spoken to, they certainly understand the need for appropriate phasing in and for leading times. And if you look at low emission zones across the country or indeed across Europe, those leading times and phasing times have been absolutely crucial. And I'll give the member the absolute reassurance that we'd want to work with the business community and others to ensure that similarly was done in Scotland. Dave Stewart. <laughs> Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. Labour welcomes the lowering of emissions as a strategy to improve air quality in Scotland. Uh, as the British Heart Foundation evidence makes clear, 80% of deaths relating to outdoor air pollution are due to heart disease or stroke. In Scotland, this deadly air pollution is most likely to come from traffic, particularly older polluting diesel vehicles. Uh, with the Scottish pilot, uh, with the Glasgow pilot LEZ, does the Minister envisage a 2018 launch date with enforcement some years later? Will the LEZs, as we've heard, include private vehicles as well as commercial and public transport? And will automatic number plate recognition technology be used to ensure greater compliance level? Will this be funded by the Scottish Government? And should emissions be reduced per passenger or per, or per vehicle? Uh, will SEPA be funded to have more automatic emissions detector equipment rather than the traditional diffusion tube? And will LEZs require primary or secondary legislation? And finally, will local authorities with LEZs have additional powers of enforcement over polluting vehicles? Hamza Youssef. 
I'm going to do my best to answer the, the nine questions that I managed to, to, to note down. Uh, I will confess from the very beginning, presiding officer, I have no further detail on the diffusion tube uh, issue, which uh, David Stewart raised with uh, myself and the Cabinet Secretary a couple of days ago, but my officials uh, are hoping to provide what is a, an important answer to, to an important uh, question. Can I also start by recognising very much on the record the work that David Stewart has done uh, in bringing forward uh, uh, his ambitions on, on low emission zones. I know he's um, banging the drum for, for many, many years uh, on this issue. Uh, let me try to address some of the issues uh, as best I possibly can. Uh, I said at the committee, of which uh, David Stewart is a member, of course, that uh, the government here realises, of course, that uh, we will have to uh, be partners in the funding and resourcing of low emission zones. And uh, I said in my statement that, of course, we are uh, a week away from uh, the spending review. And, of course, I wouldn't preempt uh, that and not attempt to preempt that. But certainly we have an understanding from government's point of view that we'll clearly uh, have to step up uh, and, and put our money uh, where our mouth is. Now, that conversation is ongoing with Glasgow, with Edinburgh, with Aberdeen uh, and Dundee. And clearly, we would want the local authority to also put its resource uh, towards that. But yes, a com an, an understanding. In terms of um, the enforcement, there was a couple of questions around enforcement, which I'll do my best to, to give them uh, an answer to. Uh, yes, having looked at the other low emission zones across the UK, uh, particularly looking at the London example, uh, they don't suggest that enforcement begins from day one of the introduction. And uh, the committee received evidence, I think, from London, if my memory serves me correctly. And they made a very good point about why enforcement uh, had to have a phase, uh, phased approach uh, to that or lead in time uh, for, for, for enforcement. I think there's a sensible argument for that. There's also, on the flip side of that, we have to ensure that the timeline doesn't run away from us. We want, of course, uh, enforce, uh, forcible LEZs uh, as soon as is practical and pragmatically possible because of uh, the outcomes that that can achieve. But, of course, a successful LEZ is one where there's not, they're not racking up any fines, of course. Uh, and, and where, of course, uh, people are complying with the designated zone. Uh, the other question you had in enforcement was around number plate recognition. And again, it will be for the local authority to come forward with the infrastructure that they think is the most appropriate. Uh, I, I think the member and I probably are, are, are uh, one and the same on this, that uh, there should be no talk of doing LEZs on the cheap. Frankly, you know, when it comes to enforcement, uh, when it comes to the designation of the zone, uh, the latest technology, the best technology possible, where Scotland can lead on that, is something we should strive to. While, of course, consideration of the, of the uh, uh, budgetary constraints that we're under. So uh, I couldn't give them a definitive about whether Glasgow or Edinburgh are looking at number plate recognition. Well, I know they're certainly exploring it, but whether they've settled on one enforcement uh, and piece of infrastructure uh, over the other. In terms of the question on per vehicle, per passenger, uh, what I would say uh, is that we're, of course, using the, the measurements that are internationally recognised uh, in relation to air quality, particularly nitrogen uh, oxide and particulate matter. Uh, they are uh, the driving force and they are the measurement criteria behind, uh, of course, where, where an air quality management uh, area exists, where a, a local strategy exists. Uh, and so we're not looking at necessarily per vehicle, per passenger uh, as, as a measurement criteria. However, the bus industry make the point to us absolutely uh, reasonably, of course, the more bums on seats, frankly, on the buses and less in cars, then the better for everybody in a win-win. So buses for me are absolutely part of uh, the, the, the solution. Um, in terms of the legislation question uh, he asked, um, we uh, believe that the legislation certainly exists uh, for the introduction uh, of low emission zones uh, for some elements of the enforcement. Uh, for other elements of the enforcement, uh, I can tell him that uh, we will, if there is any legislation, legislative requirement of which we think there might be, uh, for some elements of enforcement, I can give him some more detail uh, uh, later on, uh, we will bring that forward in the transport bill to which we've committed to. Uh, I can see already that we're not going to get through all the questions. Uh, so over to members and to the minister in relation to quicker questions and answers, please. Um, Graham Day followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you. Um, just over 360 buses have been replaced through the Green Bus Fund and the Minister, in evidence to the committee earlier this week, indicated some operators were replacing polluting vehicles at their own expense. I wonder if he could give a broad indication of how many low emission buses he expects to be in service by 2020, taking account of new and through the emission abatement programme retrofitted vehicles. Hamza Yusuf. I, I couldn't give him uh, an, an exact number, neither would I try to, try to uh, hazard a guess, but he's right, of course, in saying that uh, the 16 
uh, plus million that we spent uh, on the Green Bus Fund has allowed uh, 362 buses to be greened. And of course, I've mentioned there's another tranche uh, forthcoming in the first, first Minister on a programme for government uh, promised to extend uh, the Green Bus Fund and expand the Green Bus Fund, which I think will be very, very welcomed. But I would say to the member, on top of that, uh, we're also going to be working closely and are working closely with the bus industry to see how we can create the, the abatement scheme, excuse me, the retrofitting and abatement scheme, which will, uh, of course, incentivise retrofitting if that's appropriate. But many bus companies say to me that actually it's not money for retrofitting. We don't really want to retrofit a 13-year-old bus. We'd rather buy uh, or have assistance to buy a brand new electric bus or a Euro 6 bus. Uh, and so we have to ensure that fund uh, is also very flexible so that for different bus companies at different stages, and depends on their, the age of their, their fleet, uh, can, can uh, make use uh, of that fund. Uh, Donald Cameron, followed by Claire Hockey. Thank you. The Minister mentioned the concerns of FSB, and he will accept that residents and small businesses will be worried about the short timescales time outlined in the statement. What assurances can the Minister give small business who have, who have enough costs and bureaucracy as it is about the impact on their enterprises, and what action is the Minister taking to ensure that those who live and work within these zones and who use diesel, diesel vehicles are not prejudiced by a failure to engage them during the implementation of LEZs? Hamza Youssef. You would have heard from my answer to his colleague Jamie Green that I thought the FSB contribution was a very welcomed one. And I'll be looking forward to meeting with the FSB and the Chambers of Commerce who are written to today to see where we can have a, a conversation around low emission zones. So hopefully he heard from my answer to his colleague uh, Jamie Green that uh, although we're looking at introducing the LEZ in Glasgow by 2018, a phased approach with lead-in times uh, would be taken. So that will hopefully give some reassurance uh, to businesses. I I'm unsure at this stage whether the Conservatives actually support an LEZ or, or not, uh, but it would be helpful to get some clarification from them. Uh, on that matter, uh, of course, in due course. But uh, I can give him an absolute assurance that we'll be engaging with the public, we'll be engaging with businesses, uh, as well as, of course, engaging continually and collaboratively with local authorities. Claire Hockey, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you. Um, concerns have been raised in my own constituency by, among others, Campus Lang Community Council about air pollution in Campus Lang Main Street in particular. While well, I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to put in place low emission zones in cities, can the Minister advise me what measures will be put in place to reduce air pollution in Scotland's towns? Hamza Youssef. Uh, yes, I can. I mean, the, the Member will be aware that as well as the towns and, and cities, uh, sorry, the, the four largest cities that, that we have committed to introducing a low emission zone by, by 2020, we're also committed to low emission zones where the evidence uh, shows it in air quality management areas. Uh, by uh, 2023 as well. What we'll do is we'll continue to work with CEPA, Transport Scotland, Health Protection Scotland and others very much to further reduce air pollution and deliver benefits for human and environmental uh, health. All local authorities with air quality management areas uh, have in place, of course, uh, either final or draft uh, action plans. So we're working very closely with them. Uh, we provide practical and financial support to local authorities to tackle air pollution hotspots, including a, a total of four million pounds in annual funding to improve air quality. Uh, one million pounds of which uh, was uh, additional funding. Uh, Clean Air for Scotland have the road to healthier future sets out how the Scottish Government and partner organisations will further deliver improvements to air quality over the coming years. So while there, there are, uh, I respect what the member says, while there are no AQMAs declared in, in for example, the Canvas Lang area, South Lanarkshire Council will keep the situation I know under review uh, and will take appropriate uh, action uh, where needed. Claudia Beamish, followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister refers um, in his statement to the potential for unintended secondary effects of LEZs. I welcome the 1.6 million funding for the bus abatement retrofit programme in Scotland. Uh, can the Minister reassure the Chamber that heavy polluting buses will not be allowed to move into um, areas outside LEZ zones, um, often, I, I fear, threatening residents' health in deprived uh, suburbs. Hamza Youssef. The member is absolutely right, and again, let me put it on record, I know her interest uh, in this issue uh, and her campaigning on this issue. And the member is absolutely right to mention the issue of displacement. I hope I, I spoke about that and she heard me speak about that um, in the statements. So we're very, very conscious uh, of that, and I know the local authorities are conscious of that. And Glasgow is still to, to of course, uh, come forward with its um, 
first uh, it's, it's final proposals, I should say, on the scope of the low emission zone for Glasgow. But clearly, we wouldn't want that displacement to affect those areas outside of the Glasgow box or the Glasgow uh, zone. So we're very, very conscious of that. In terms of the, the, the exact question uh, that she asked, uh, I would give her reassurances from the bus companies that I've spoken to, particularly the large operators, your first buses, stagecoaches, uh, McGill's and, and so on and so forth and, and, and others, uh, Lothian buses. They, their plans for greening their fleet are hugely impressive and ambitious. And if she hasn't visited any of those bus operators that I've mentioned, the large ones, she, she, she would do well to, to do so because they all understand that this is the way that Scotland is going. Now, can I give an absolute commitment, an absolute promise that, that, that on day one, uh, no uh, bus with a, with a Euro 3 engine will be outside a low emission zone? Of, of course I couldn't, and I don't think she would expect that uh, to be the case. Can I say that we're working towards having the cleanest, the greenest fleet uh, that we possibly can, and can we help to assist that through the abatement scheme? Absolutely, but can I give her a further assurance that it's not just the government that has that ambition, but from the bus companies that I've spoke to, they absolutely share that. Mark Ruskell, followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I mean, notwithstanding the answer to that last question, the statement does identify that only 47 buses went through the Green Bus Fund uh, in the last round, round seven, and that's less than 1% of the total bus fleet across Scotland. So, I mean, does the Minister acknowledge that the acceleration that we need in conversion or uh, the purchase of new buses will, will need to happen uh, in the years ahead if we're to tackle not just the LEZs, but also to roll out uh, actions to the air quality and management areas. Hamza Youssef. Yes, for, for brevity, uh, absolutely is the case. Now, um, <clears throat> clearly we've made significant progress, but we understand that when it comes to the introduction of low emission zones, we're going to have to make uh, progress, and I think at a quicker speed uh, than we have. So that is why when the spending review uh, comes forward, you'll see, uh, uh, hopefully, of course, some more detail uh, on that. But we're already committing, as I said, that 1.6 million to the abatement scheme which I hope will, will, will progress that issue, but notwithstanding what I already said to Claudia Beamish, uh, the member would do very well to, to, because she's got an interest in this issue, to visit the bus operators and hear from them what I think are really ambitious but very welcome plans for greening their fleet. Liam MacArthur, followed by Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I, too, thank the, uh, the, the Minister for early sight of his statement. He refers uh, to the ambition to expand the uh, electric vehicle charging network, which I very much support. But will he recognise that key to um, uh, improving take-up of EVs is improving the maintenance and the reliability of that network? And can you maybe outline the steps that the, the government plans to take to ensure that that happens? And in particular, whether you will commit uh, to ensuring that uh, there's a default of free vend uh, on charging points um, to address some of the problems that have been arising with the current network. Hamza Youssef. <coughs> can I thank the member for the question? Can I also uh, acknowledge his interest in this? And we've met on many occasions in electric vehicles in Orkney, of course, as a leader uh, when it comes to the take-up per head per capita of electric vehicles. Um, th there's, uh, I share his, his, his ambitions, and I should say that some of our, our charging points do default uh, to free, but I think uh, he's absolutely right seeing that across the network. Uh, is a very good idea and I can give him assurance after our last meeting my officials are exploring that very idea uh, that he put forward uh, to me. In terms of the infrastructure, we're very proud that we have over 700 charge points. I think from memory over 150 of them are, are, are rapid charge points. So the infrastructure, yes, we have to expand that. And we have a good charging network in Scotland, but we have to absolutely expand that uh, if we want to get towards our, our vision uh, for 2032. But we also have to work on behavioural change as well. Uh, I think that's hugely important. And the third thing, of course, we have to do is work on uh, reducing the upfront capital cost uh, of electric vehicles. Now, that's happening due to market forces anyway, due to supply and demand. Uh, but clearly, the schemes that we have in terms of uh, con conjunction with the Energy Saving Trust, which allow a, an interest-free loan for the purchase uh, of electric vehicles, uh, is, is a part of that as well. And any other initiatives uh, will, of course, bring forward in good time, and I'm sure they'll be welcomed uh, by the member. Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, urban consolidation hubs can enhance low emission zones by reducing business costs, helping to standardise freight traffic, and also tackling congestion and pollution problems. Will the Minister expand the trial project in Dundee to comprehensively cover the city, which is a pollution hotspot, as well as create another hub in Glasgow, another pollution hotspot, in 2018? Hamza Youssef. Um, I acknowledge the member's uh, persistence on, on, on the issue, and I've met with him on freight consolidation centres. And of course, 
Uh, there's much evidence to suggest that they, they of course, help in, in relation to carbon reduction and improving air quality. I should say the evidence, though, some evidence across the United Kingdom does suggest that the, uh, the impact of them uh, is perhaps uh, not as significant as other measures that we could take, such as, as low emissions. Well, that's not to discard uh, the issue. It's simply to take an evidence-based uh, approach uh, at it. So um, what I will say to him, that is I will look at the, and reflect on the question that he asks me. It's not within our current plans, I should say, to, have, um, to, to, to further fund uh, consolidation hubs in, in, in Glasgow and some of the other cities that you mentioned. But again, I'll give it <coughs> consideration. But he will realise with... Uh, uh, with, the, with the budget constrictions and restrictions that we have, you know, we're going to have to invest in where I think we can make the biggest bang for that buck. And for me, low emission zones are an exciting opportunity, uh, one that, are, that is tried and tested in other parts of the United Kingdom, the European continent. And that's not to discard what he says in consolidation hubs at all. And as I said, I'll, I'll reflect on, on, on his question. I have time for a short question from Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. Um, thank the Minister for the, the statement and I'm glad to see it's got a significant focus on modal shift from private to public transport. Um, but clearly there is a risk of unintended consequences if bus fleets aren't in a position to operate in the LEZ, particularly in the Glasgow city centre, for example, where the same bus would run right through, right through the city. Is there a risk of unintended consequences and actually leading to a rise in pr private transport due to unavailability of buses? And can the Minister give us any more information on the, the plans and timescales for the engine refit centre? A short answer too, please, Minister. Well, he's absolutely right. I wouldn't disagree with, with Ivan McKee. Uh, the introduction of a low emission zone, its enforcement has to be coupled with better, more affordable public transport that is more frequent uh, and, and uh, you know, is more accessible to people. So I accept his points. I agree with his points. And that's why phasing times and leading times are, are very important. And I would just reiterate my answer to David Stewart. There has to be a balance, of course, between the appropriate time that the bus industry needs, that private car owners need, that business needs, and making sure we push ahead with this so that we realise the benefits of air quality uh, for future generations to come. That concludes questions. The Minister's statement. Apologies to those I was unable to call. And I'll give a couple of minutes for folks to move seats around.